thinking back in, in, in this room um, when I did work at Chatham House, and um, this was a time of the, probably the last great nuclear debate, in the late 70s in particular, the early 80s. Um, and I, f I remember finding myself then in a very odd position because I had considered myself through my working on uh, nuclear issues for my PhD and um, uh, even when I came here, um, that I was really a dove on these matters because the people that I'd been uh, challenging, um, even then called neocons, um, were, were those who believed that the Soviet Union had a plan to win a nuclear war uh, and that it really made it an enormous difference uh, about whether or not you had ballistic missile defenses or how many weapons you had. They, the first strikes had a reality and a credibility that I th always thought was a bit overstated. And then all of a sudden along, um, along came uh, the European nuclear disarmament movement, or END, uh, with E.P. Thompson. And in one of his polemics, I was described as a compliant cowboy, a, t um, a term which you know, rankles still, um, uh, that um, for, uh, for being an apparent proponent of deterrence, um, which I suppose I, I, I was, and, and not accepting um, the logic of, of disarmament. And I heard some quite interesting and profit. It was quite hard, actually, to engage in debate um, because... It was you know, I'm going along to sort of CND gatherings, and it was basically so you're here to defend burning babies uh, uh, and, and Armageddon, and actually that wasn't what I was about. And I want to start again, as I used to say that I'm not pro-nuclear. I'm not even particularly pro-deterrence. Um, nuclear weapons exist in my lifetime, um, certainly, and in the lifetime of others and probably most people here, they're probably still going to exist, however successful we are with disarmament. So really the challenge for, for the nuclear age is how to make the best of a bad job. That's my starting point. Um, there are people who, who can make a convincing case that nuclear weapons have been a net plus for the international community uh, uh, up to now, and I think you can make that case quite convincingly up to now. But in everybody's mind, unless they're absolutely stupid, uh, is, is, is the, that back uh, drop of thought that maybe at some point it'll go horribly wrong and we'll face uh, a horrible disaster. So I'm not complacent about nuclear weapons. Um, I think even when I was engaging in those debates at that time, notably, as I recall, with Mary Calder, uh, Part of the, the argument was in the short term, I wasn't too worried, but in the long term, it was hard to see how you could go on like this indefinitely. So I'm, I, instead, this is my starting point is not that I'm happy with this situation or content, but in some basic sense, we're, we're stuck with it. And so the question of is nuclear weapons fit for purpose? Well, in basic sense, obviously they are. They can destroy a large uh, amount of people and property. Um, so that's what they do. Uh, the question is, how do we cope with it? And to me, the challenge of a nuclear policy is how to make sure they're not used. Uh, th that's the basic test against which nuclear policies have got to be judged. And one of the best ways to ensure they're not used is to avoid the sort of conflicts that might prompt their use. Um, I remember there was an enormous and incredibly expensive research project at Harvard in the 80s uh, on the, the Avoiding Nuclear War Project, which on the sort of insight per dollar ratio against which these things should be judged, came out with the bleeding obviously conclusion that the best way to avoid a nuclear war is to avoid war. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's true. Uh, so, so, and that's where deterrence comes in, because what nuclear weapons can do uh, is make people incredibly cautious. Uh, if they're about to get into a situation in which it may be that uh, they may be used. Now, one of the reasons why some people are uh, quite positive about the impact of nuclear weapons is we've really done quite well uh, in, the nuclear, in coping with the nuclear age. Uh, 
uh, if you go back to the early 60s and the various prognostications made then, both quoting C.P. Snow about the, the sort of statistical inevitability of, of, of a nuclear war before the end of, end of that decade, or the assumption of the Kennedy administration that there would soon be 15, 16 nuclear powers and so on. The idea that we'd reach it to 2013 without one of these things being used in anger again uh, would have been considered remarkable and probably very complacent and, and sanguine. So we've done, we haven't done badly. And if you look at, uh, at the distribution of nuclear strength, you can see that basically there are two types of nuclear powers with a bit of overlap. The one of the, the old great powers, um, the five permanent members of the Security Council, essentially. Um, it's worked out that way. And the second are the chronically insecure. Uh, and the question, traditional question about nuclear deterrence um, was the first category. People talked about a third world war uh, in terms of a continued, you know, the third of the series that began with the first and the second world war um, uh, and the assumption that it would follow the trend set in the third world and the second world war which after all ended with the uh, only two examples of hostile nuclear use that we've got. It assumed that that would carry on into uh, other uh, destructive power. And something happened that uh, gave political leaders pause. Now, there's a big debate, which we, we'll no doubt get into, about whether deterrence made a difference in this, um, in the sense that, uh, and, and I think we have to be careful in what we're talking about here. There's one sense of deterrence in terms of the deliberate threats posed by uh, NATO countries to the Soviet Union, if you do this, we will respond in that way, which over time became increasingly incredible, and it was hard to believe why, to come out with good reasons why you would necessarily do that sort of thing. And the second sort of deterrence, which is much more general, diffuse, but uh, what later became called existential, which is basically, if we move in this direction, it could be awful. Things will happen which we can't control. Escalation was, was, was the word that was developed to describe this process. In which case, um, like all wars, you, you start off believing you can keep it contained and limited and short, but things will happen that will get you into a position where it's absolutely awful uh, and that we, we will have lost control. Um, and. You know, this goes back to sort of classic debates of, of nuclear strategy that took place uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, Schelling, Tom Schelling, of the great, still, one of the still alive, sort of the great theorist of, of nuclear strategy, talked about um, the threat that leaves something to chance. Um, recognized that there was this question of loss of control that uncertainty was a powerful deterrent. Whereas, you know, on the hand, you had Herman Kahn, who had this famous sort of 44 ladders of escalation, which you started using nuclear weapons after point 15, and it was just sort of trying to work out how many different ways can you use nuclear weapons that made Khan's work so sort of appalling and staggering at the same time, ending in what he called, claiming not to appreciate the implications, a wargasm uh, right, right at the end. Um, but that, even Khan recognized at some point this control would be lost, but, but he believed you could keep control for much longer. I don't think people have that confidence. Nobody's tried, and there's no, there's no case law. There's, no, uh, there's nothing that we can go to that tells us what a nuclear war would be like. All that we know uh, is that when a series of political leaders have been faced with the possibility, they've tried to find a way out of it. Um, and you can see it in the correspondence between Khrushchev and Kennedy during the Berlin and Cuban Missile Crises. In a way, you can see it with Indian policymakers when, when Western embassies started to withdraw their people um, uh, just over a decade ago when there was a, a big crisis. Uh, and they said, no, people actually were taking this possibility quite seriously. So I think, I think deterrence works in that way. Not 
hundred percent. It's not. It's not. You, you, there's not an iron law of deterrence here, um, but you just have to take that into account. So, the third point I just want to make uh, about uh, about forms of deterrence is a lot of the discussion of deterrence goes on away from the possibility of nuclear war. In fact, all the discussion, most of the discussion we've had. And a lot of it is about alliances uh, and reassurances and security guarantees and so on. Now, whether any of this means very much is very hard to tell. Um, because nuclear guarantees, if when it came to reading the small print, might not look quite so firm uh, and resolute uh, as they might be when they're issued, like most guarantees. But um, it is an important part of the debate. And so my final point is really related to the policies that we adopt now. My view for some time has been that there's, lot, there's enormous surplus capacity, there's enormous role for, plenty of role for disarmament and arms control, um, uh, uh, and that's all to the good. But you have to be very careful what you're doing. And I'm not so much worried about the problem of maintaining a balance of uh, uh, deterrence at, at small numbers. I think it's much more about alliance. The essence of deterrence in some, for most countries is alliance because they don't have nuclear weapons of their own. And therefore, the challenge, it seems to me, in the, in the future is how do you convince countries that are, don't have their own nuclear weapons, that they don't need their own nuclear weapons because they have a great power benefactor that will look after them. And I think a lot of policies have to be judged on that. And that has to be judged because actually now the major problem uh, that we face of nuclear use is not at the moment the great powers, but the chronically insecure. It, it's the Pakistans, the Israelis, the North Koreans, maybe eventually the Iranians. These are the ones that are more, most likely to get into situations where they might be used. Might be used. And countries, <coughs> and the sort of logic and analysis and so on that we use to consider the policies of the great powers are very different from those that might affect these powers. And the area of the greatest uncertainty. But given that these other powers exist, that is what creates the problem of extended deterrence. It raises questions for the great powers as to what role they should play in providing deterrence on behalf of those who may be threatened by the chronically insecure. That seems to me the big challenge for the future. I don't think it's a particularly an issue for disarmament. I began work on nuclear weapons uh, issues 30 years ago and conducted a sort of unconventional review of the fact um, and uh, have worked really on a um, what I hope is a careful and pragmatic reevaluation of the entire field. And um, my goal uh, is, uh, I think, <coughs> similar to yours, which is I, I want security for um, my country and the other countries that uh, I like and care about. And uh, in general, I think the world is better off when there's peace. So, um, but uh, what concerns me is that um, we seem to have a sense that nuclear weapons are uh, reliable because of the absence of nuclear war. Nuclear deterrence is reliable because the absence of nuclear war over the last 68 years. And um, it, it seems to me that if you're going to risk the lives of millions of people, or at least hundreds of thousands of people, that it makes sense to be absolutely sure that you need a relatively high standard of proof, and that proof by absence doesn't meet that criteria. I remind you that. <coughs> Two years ago, I could have sat here and said that the possibility that there would ever be a major storm in the United States that brought floodwaters onto Long Island and New York and New Jersey and destroyed thousands of homes was impossible because it had never happened for 200 years. 
fact is that just because something bad hasn't happened recently doesn't mean it can't happen. Um, so my review has essentially reached two conclusions. One is that our one field test of nuclear weapons has been misunderstood. And I think it's important to recall that um, the prob one of the real problems with nuclear weapons is that it is a, a field with very little factual information. We've done a lot of testing, but um, I think about uh, medieval thinking about the solar system. They essentially um, seven pieces of data the stars in the sky, and the sun, moon, earth, and five visible planets. Wait, that's eight. Um, it's a relatively small set of facts out of which to build a theory of how the universe is put together. We in the nuclear weapons field have a worse time because we have really one solid piece of evidence, which is the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, um, and, and potentially, although it's very slippery and difficult to judge, a series of facts based on historical crises involving nuclear weapons. Even so, it's a relatively small uh, factual basis. If you consider that, for instance, machine guns uh, were developed uh, and it took really years before British, German, and French military officials understood how machine guns were going to impact the battlefield and how best to accommodate their existence on the battlefield. 1914, 15, and 16 were examples of uh, how difficult it is to incorporate new technology into our thinking. So that's a troubling uh, fact. Um, the other two things that, uh, and the, the truly disturbing thing about this paucity of information is that it's relatively clear that we've got, his, uh, we've got Hiroshima wrong. The Japanese said they surrendered because of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were actually covering up the fact that they lost a war and they needed a good excuse for having lost that war. They, uh, recent historical research of the last 10 years demonstrates relatively clearly that it was the Soviet declaration of war and invasion of Manchuria and Sakhalin Island and various other territories that led the Japanese to surrender. That is what touched off the real crisis. Um, so that's, that's sobering. If you're one major field test that you've been relying on pretty heavily for 60 years, it turns out you've been interpreting it exactly backwards. Nuclear weapons didn't have a major impact. In fact, the Japanese leadership seems to have largely ignored the nuclear weapons uh, bombings. So. Um, what does that say about the uh, ability, this, the kind of magical ability of nuclear weapons to coerce and deter that Stimson talked about them being psychological weapons? Well, if they didn't psychologically impact Japan's leadership, how do we, how do we evaluate that? Clearly, there's a danger. So then nuclear deterrence. Clearly, there's danger uh, that a nuclear war, of, a, of nuclear war with nuclear deterrence. The question is not, does nuclear deterrence work? Clearly, it must work sometimes. Nuclear war is terrifying. So it must be that nuclear deterrence does reliably restrain us sometimes. The problem is how often, where, and how often, and how reliably. Does nuclear deterrence work in 30% of the cases? Well, that's a relatively known, low number. If 60% of the time, there's 70% of the time, there's a possibility that you're going to, the crisis is going to spiral out of control, then that's, that's a cause for concern. Uh, does it work 90% of the time, 95% of the time? And, and if you owned a handgun that you really liked and thought was very valuable, but that had a tendency to explode in your hand some percentage of the time, you have to ask yourself, how large is the percentage that you're willing to put up with? Is it if, it, if there's a 2% chance of it blowing up in your hand or a 4% chance? So the, it seems to me the key question is not, does nuclear deterrence work? The question is, how reliable is it? And the problem is that I think our historical studies have not fairly addressed the facts. Uh, for instance, I was talking to Stephen Wald at Harvard, and he, I was 
made some of these arguments, and he said to me, Ward, you know, what about the Cuban Missile Crisis? I mean, that is clear proof that nuclear deterrence works. The Soviets put missiles in, and there was a risk of nuclear war, and then they took them out. So it obviously works. And then, but I think that the problem with that argument is that we never talk about Kennedy's decision. Kennedy uh, knew that if he blockaded Cuba, that there was a risk of nuclear war. In the week of deliberations where they were deciding on the policy, they mentioned the possibility of nuclear war 60 times. But uh, they went ahead with that action, that risky, that aggressive action anyway. So the question is, why didn't nuclear deterrence restrain Kennedy, apparently? And I think if you go back and look at the various crises, the Middle East War of 1973, Sadat and Assad, why weren't they restrained by nuclear deterrence? The question isn't, did putting nuclear weapons on alert dissuade the Russians from sending a paratroop brigade to Egypt? The question is, what were Sadat and Assad thinking? How, how was it that they could believe that they knew enough about Israeli intentions that they could safely make war on the occupied territories and the Israeli forces there without risking nuclear war? Why didn't deterrence work? So I think that over time, what happens is that it's difficult to, that, that we have looked back at the facts and selectively pulled out the successes of nuclear deterrence and said, this is terrific. Nuclear deterrence works. It's reliable. Therefore, it must be safe. And so uh, we can continue to rely on it. So I'm, I am a nuclear deterrence pessimist. I think that it's less reliable than we had thought. Hiroshima. Uh, historians have argued about this for a long time. The weight of historical evidence is that nuclear weapons made a difference to the Japanese decision to end the war. Otherwise, why did Hirohito mention it in his surrender broadcast? Um, Manchuria, Russian invasion, obviously important. Uh, also, Japan would have surrendered at some point anyway, probably. But nuclear weapons had an effect at the time. I think it's absolutely irrelevant. I don't think it strengthens the case for deterrence if I'm right on that and you're wrong, because these cases are sui generis. What we know from Hiroshima is that um, what nuclear weapons can do, it, le it left a lasting imprint on people's mind. It wasn't a speculative possibility, as we would find still if we were trying to talk about biological warfare on a massive scale. We know what nuclear weapons can do because we've seen the pictures and we've heard the survivors. I've been to the museum at Hiroshima. So that's what it did. And somebody once talked about the crystal ball effect, which was if you knew in 1914 how you were likely to end up in 1918, you might have been a little bit more careful on the diplomacy. Uh, you might have thought, well, let's pause a little moment here and let's just see where this may be taking us, folks. Um, with nu if you're moving into a situation where nuclear war is a possibility, you've got an image in your mind about where it can lead to, and that's very important. Uh, and it was there with, with, with Kennedy. Who was reckless or not, uh, in, the, in the origins of the missile crisis, which of course were, was a crisis of the nuclear age. If they hadn't have nuclear weapons, it wouldn't have been a crisis in the first place. Uh, but there's no doubt that Kennedy's behavior um, in, in the last days of, of the crisis was uh, in, uh, animated at all points by a determination to avoid, uh, uh, avoid nuclear war, uh, which is why he had the back channel going, why the, the Turkey offer was made, and so on and so forth. Kennedy did not want a nuclear war. He wasn't reckless in this regard. So that's the only information we've got. It's true. Uh, we're, and we have to work out, if we're looking ahead, how people, often in cultures different from our own that we don't understand very well, may respond. That's why I, don't, you know, I would never say uh, deterrence is going to work well in all circumstances. Let me just uh, if I identify picking up on, on things that, so I, I think the history doesn't prove anything in this. It, 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 there's no proofs in history. Um, 
because there are so many different variables at play each time. All we know is that politicians faced with the prospect of nuclear war have become quite cautious, and that's a good thing. Um, so let me just raise two, two, two issues that, that I think are areas where it may be worth taking the discussion further. The first is um, uh, the, this question of the relationship between nuclear war and conventional war, which I think is important. Because when Ward was saying that the deterrence hasn't worked, what he said on a couple of cases is the existence of nuclear weapons has not stopped conventional war, which is undoubtedly the case. Um, and, you know, one can, I haven't had the Falkland cited at me at times as, you know, example of a failure of nuclear deterrence. Well, it wasn't a failure of nuclear deterrence because nobody in their right minds uh, ever thought that nuclear weapons were likely to be used in a situation such as that, although there was a, a nuclear dimension to the, to the, to the conflict. Um, so there's really the, the issue which goes to the heart of the question of the role of uncertainty uh, and a fear of escalation is what confidence will there be in the future if you embark on a war which you believe will be conventional of it staying that way? And that's <coughs> relevant to uh, the Russians, it's relevant to the Indians and the Pakistanis. In a way, it's become less relevant to us, which is why the enthusiasm for disarmament has grown in the West, because our belief and, and reliance on nuclear deterrence has declined because we really don't need it so more, because conventionally we should be strong enough to deal with, with all comers, if I'm including the United States in this. Whereas the Russians have become more dependent upon nuclear deterrence. So I think there is an important issue here that's, wor that's worth addressing about the relationship between the two. Um, and third, a uh, second, I mean, we, we, I do think we need to get into this question of alliance. If the United States nuclear arsenal had a deterrent effect on European security, it was because the United States was allied to Western Europe. If it hadn't been, it might not have done. Um, and I think these relationships, these alliance relationships may well be becoming more tenuous. I think that's as much of a challenge to, to the credibility of deterrence uh, as whether or not one thinks a politician in their right mind would use it. And just a, a point to leave you with, this question of who, you know, who would have thought. If you're with a, um, you're going to choose an airline, um, Here's one that's got an immaculate safety record for 68 years, never had a crash. Do you go for that one because it's never had a crash? Um, it's got this immaculate safety record. Oh, on the laws of probability, you think it's due for one soon. The fact is we know what nuclear weapons can physically do, but the essential thing that we thought we learned from Hiroshima, what Stimson said in his article, in uh, Harper's in uh, February of 47 is that we understood the psychological impact that they had on leaders' minds. Well, the fact is, that's exactly what we don't know. We don't know what impact uh, the fear of nuclear weapons or even the use of nuclear weapons has on leaders' political and military decisions. So uh, I, I'm not convinced that because we've done a lot of testing in deserts that we're fully aware of how people will or will not respond to nuclear weapons. On the issue of Hirohito, why didn't he mention uh, nuclear or uh, the Russians if it was that was the reason why they were surrendering? There are several reasons. One is leaders, politicians, I'm, I'm sure you'll be shocked to know, don't always explain their innermost reasons for the things that they do, particularly in public statements. And in fact, Hirohito issued two calls for surrender, one to the general public, which obviously cared about bombing, and in that call on the 15th, he talked about bombing, and also one to the military on the 17th, uh, in which he didn't mention the bomb at all, but only mentioned Russia as a reason for surrendering, because the military men, he felt, would understand strategy better, or I'm assuming he felt would understand strategy better, and therefore he used the argument with them that he thought would be most likely to persuade them. So um, it has certainly been true that 
throughout the first 40 years of discussion about Hiroshima, people assumed that the bombs won the war. The fact is, over the last 10 years, there have been significant openings up of uh, archives in Russia and Japan. And the, late, the newest research seems to be um, quite persuasive that uh, whereas Hiroshima just didn't touch off a crisis at all, the Russian invasion uh, did, um, consider that the Supreme Council um, uh, didn't meet after Hiroshima. Uh, the sec the, in fact, there's a diary entry by uh, Kwabe Toroshiro, who's the deputy chief of staff of the army, and he says, oh, I heard, it's on the 8th, two days after the bombing of Hiroshima, I heard they bombed Hiroshima with a nuclear bomb, and uh, it's, it's a problem, but we must be tenacious and fight on. So this is on the ninth, the, the evening of the 8th, he's writing in his diary, okay, reflecting back. And the next morning, he rushes down to a meeting with the military and says, uh, we have to depose the emperor and set up a military government and uh, you know, that way we'll be able to keep fighting. Well, what happened? The Soviets invaded at midnight during the night. No emergency meeting was held after Hiroshima was bombed. No one suggested that the emperor be overthrown on the morning that Hir after Hiroshima was bombed. Supreme Council doesn't meet on the morning that Hiroshima is bombed. Supreme Council meets the morning that the Russians invade. So there's a lot of evidence, particularly timing and diary entries from that period of time. After the war is over, they all rally around and say, oh, yes, it was Hiroshima. But if you look at the contemporaneous documents, the case is much stronger. Um, my sense about the Cuban Missile Crisis is that the important lesson to draw from it is not that deterrence worked, but that we were lucky. The, the role that luck plays in avoiding war sometimes. Um, the height of the crisis, a U-2 strays over Russia um, 300 miles. Russians scramble MiGs to shoot it down. The U.S. scrambles F-104s to find it, safeguard it, and bring it back except it's the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So they've taken all of the conventional air-to-air -air missiles off of the F-104s, and they've replaced them with Falcon nuclear missiles. So the only missiles that those fighters, the only armaments that they have are nuclear. If those two sets of fighters had run into each other, there would have been a nuclear explosion over Russia and likely a nuclear war. Well, that didn't happen. But it didn't happen because deterrence works like magic. It happened because we were lucky. Nuclear weapons have not really been smart military technologies as such, uh, which is why there are so few what used to be called tactical nuclear weapons, which is always an odd concept, um, and, or short-range nuclear weapons around anymore. Um, my favorite was, um, we we're going to give odd weapons, was the Davy Crockett. Uh, which was a weapon, a mortar, that had a, a lethal radius greater than its range. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, I think the idea that nuclear weapons could be used as a more efficient form of firepower is now pretty well discredited, and that has implications for the future in terms of this question of how you would move from a conventional to a to a nuclear war, because that was, in the theory, one of the ways. Um, Schelling, who I mentioned before, made a sort of powerful distinction between weapons that would, could seize territory and, uh, and take things by force, and the power, what he called the power to hurt. And what nuclear weapons have is the power to hurt. Now, that poses enormous ethical questions. It also poses an interesting strategic question to show that I'm not particularly arguing one way or the other as to where we should go on this. In our thinking about conventional war, where in a way that we weren't in 1945, we stress more and more the importance of protecting non-competent civilians, uh, the innocent, etc., uh, and expect our weapons to be more and more precise um, and get offended by collateral damage. That w so that seems an imp really important change because actually while we're maintaining nuclear weapons, we're maintaining something that at certain points could be far greater shift of gear than 
um, than was the case in 45. I, 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 I mean, it's so tempting to get into historical. There are multiple explanations of most events. Um, and this will be true in the future. You think you're controlling the thing that will really make the difference, and actually it's something else, or this is something else again. You know, the, 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 most, most events have more than one cause. There's no simple cause and effect relationships. But one of the, thi one of the reasons that was an issue in, in 45 was what difference did it make to have a single nuclear weapon as against a couple of hundred uh, American bombers firebombing. I mean, more people were killed in the firebombing of Tokyo than were killed in Hiroshima. It was the shock effect of a single weapon, and the casualties were the result of people not realizing this was an air raid. So they were out in the open when they, were, when they might have been in shelters, and the numbers that would have been killed would have been fewer. Still horrific, but fewer. And it was because of the link between uh, conventional air raids and this new weapon that could do it oh so more efficiently, and then we later discovered with the horrible radiological effects coming on beside. Now that seems to me that link is, in Western thinking, in Western thinking, has been broken. Um, it could be put together again, and in Russian thinking, I don't think it has been broken. You can't stuff the nuclear genie back in the bottle. And um, those of you who read Chatham House's The World Today will know that I have a view about this. Um, this is a powerful argument. You can't disinvent nuclear weapons. It's absolutely true. Also happens to be absolutely irrelevant because no technology is ever disinvented. That's not how technology goes away. In the majority of cases, technology goes away because uh, better technology comes along. But in uh, some cases, technology goes away because it was stupid technology and people set it aside. I think the classic example of this is the Hiller VZ-1. It's a small platform about this big, a small helicopter blade underneath. And a single soldier could stand on it and be lifted 15 or maybe even 20 feet up in the air. It's really remarkable gee whiz technology, developed by the US Army in 1953. But it never went into production particularly because some people called it the here I am totally exposed, completely vulnerable, death platform. <laughs> it just wasn't good technology. And the question is not whether nuclear weapons can or can't be disinvented. That's a red herring. The question is whether they're smart military technology. It seems to me that the fact that no one has found an occasion when their use was really called for in the last 70 years may be an indication that their terrifying and deterrence works perfectly. But it may also be an indication that they're just very, not very good weapons. Too blundering, too big, too clumsy for any real purpose.